Hi, I'm Howard Marks. I'm here today to talk about cycles with three of my senior colleagues, Bob O'Leary, co-portfolio manager of the Distressed Debt Group, uh, Jordan Cruz, co-portfolio manager of the Special Situations Group, and Julio Herrera, the portfolio manager of our Emerging Markets Debt Group for performing and, and uh, non-performing distressed debt. Cycles are one of the most important things in the world of investing. They have an enormous impact on people's psyches and on the markets that determine our opportunities. So uh, I guess first I'd like to ask Bob, what are some of the things that make the availability of credit wax and wane? I think um, a, a lot of what it boils down to is the belief or the sentiment among investors uh, that uh, something that has persisted for a long period of time is being disrupted. When those uh, delusions go away, then people start to retrench and take away the capital that they had very freely offered in, in prior periods. Uh, and in those situations, yes, normal functioning of the capital markets, particularly the fixed income market, is not uh, there, and it allows for alternative providers of capital to step in and, and provide uh, solutions. I think one of the most important things for people to realize is that uh, these phenomena, like the credit market, are not mechanical, and they don't work like finely honed machines. They are really driven by psychology. And it's important to realize that psychology tends to go to excess. So when the delusions are prevalent, people swallow them hook, line, and sinker. And then when some uncertainty arises, they reject them wholesale. And the credit window uh, certainly slams shut from time to time, and you can't borrow. And, and, and Jordan, what happens to a borrower when the credit window slams shut, especially around refinancing time? Yeah, I mean, that, that creates a great opportunity. When the markets are, are unfavorable and it's hard to raise uh, primary debt financing, a company that either has a liquidity issue or has a maturity issue, um, is gonna have to look for that alternative capital, which is where we can step in and take advantage of that. I mean, even in strong financing environments, like we've been in, you know, frankly, for the last four or five years, save a couple windows here and there, um, there are companies that are just never gonna be able to access that traditional financing market. They're too levered, there's, there's too much trouble within the business, but, um, you know, you've seen a lot of stretch financing get done over the last four or five years, and you know, for companies that are at that sort of far right end of the stretch, it makes it much harder when the when the windows close. You know, we talk about psychology. I'm not sure anything really changed in the marketplace, but in November of 15, it felt like there was sort of a pervasive move down in the credit markets, both in the primary market, you couldn't finance anything, secondary market traded down. And in February of 16, you know, I would have told you, I think this is it, it's coming, this is a big one. And then in March, it snapped right back. And I think the psychology just changed overnight. The world all of a sudden was falling apart. And then two months later, the world changed its mind. Julio, you're in the emerging markets. Um, I think we would probably all agree that you see some of the wildest swings in uh, perception, interpretation, and certainly in confidence. Can you, can you tell us about that? Sure. I have 72 different countries with different swings going on all the time. So there's always some sort of drama somewhere in the world. And credit markets today in EM are perhaps the most extended I've ever seen them in the 20 years that I've been investing. Uh, today we see spreads for credit in EM inside of US and developed market spreads, which indicates that investors have completely disregarded all of the most obvious risks, the individual specific credit risk, the macroeconomic risk, the legal and structural risk. So today, they need to go to the strength. They need an examination. It is absolutely extreme. Back in the 90s, everybody said, oh, this is great, the emerging markets, we love them. Look at Mexico. It's, it's just like the US, except that it's faster growing, and it's right over there. Right. And so, so the, the yield spread, the required risk premium contracted. People said, well, we don't need a risk premium. Then in the next year, we had a peso devaluation, of course. Uh, a, a armed rebellion in Chiapas, right. the assassination of a presidential candidate. Oh, it all comes at once. And people said, oh yeah, there are certain specific risks in EM. We better take that spread really wide to right. give us enough risk premium. And it's the, it's the coming and going of confidence 
uh, among other things, that, that creates our opportunities. The only other thing I would add to that is that you also see confidence from the other side. For example, when the money's rushing in, psychology is fantastic, right? Every, nothing can go wrong. And so companies begin to expand. They get imperial ambitions, and investors get wrapped up in funding these huge projects. And I think that that leads EM into um, even larger swings because there's excess capacity. And as we saw in Mexico and in Asia after 1997, a lot of excess capacity was created in industries that then begin to feed back into the credit cycle, even in developed markets. So the interesting thing about cycles is that everybody says to me, where are we in the cycle? And there isn't one cycle. There are lots of cycles. And they all interact so that the, the, the cycle in credit availability is affected by the cycle in psychology, but it also affects uh, the cycle in corporate behavior. And, and I think that's just one, one tiny example. Bob, you've seen your business really is predicated on taking advantage of those few opportunities uh, when, the, when the credit window is shut, right? That's correct. To your point about the uncertainty of, as to the arrival of, of a given cycle, um, you have to build in a lot of flexibility into your business model. But uh, when it arrives, you have to take advantage. Because another feature that we've seen of recent cycles, and, and Jordan mentioned the 15, 16 uh, sort of episode, they are very attenuated. There, there is, you know, I think there was really six weeks of a buying opportunity at the beginning of 16 um, that you could really take advantage of. So if you're not positioned to take advantage of that, you can miss something very substantial and something very important for the, for the survival of the strategy. I think that the, that the opening and closing of the credit window is really pivotal. Uh, if you think about it, very few companies from the bottom of the stack to the top of the stack ever pay off their debts. That's right. All they do is roll them over. It used to be you issued 10-year bonds and the problem was down the road and you didn't worry about it and you always refinance way ahead of that. What I will tell you in today's environment, um, <clears throat> even when markets are strong, uh, you, you, the maturity issue is a bigger issue than it was because you have bank debt deals that are now four and five years and you have bonds that are anywhere from five to seven years. And so the time frame in which a company needs to earn into a capital structure if it's highly levered at the beginning has changed. I mean, if you look at the just volume of debt outstanding today, it's a result of very strong credit markets. It's almost twice what it was before the financial crisis, and that just creates more highly levered businesses. And so for later, for later, not all those companies are going to perform perfectly. Some of them are going to get to a maturity, and notwithstanding where the credit markets are at the time they need to re refinance when the credit market is closed, which again, we've seen those windows over time, but even in really strong financing environments, there are just companies that can't refinance. And as a result, that creates opportunity. They're either going to default, and that credit structure is going to break down, and you can buy it through the debt, or you're going to have an opportunity to provide some sort of uh, rescue financing to that company. I mean, it is, as Jordan said, you know, a lot of the stuff that we look at um, occurs in a frothy period of time when uh, investors aren't that discriminating. Uh, they don't really. Um, there's a competition for yield. That's what we're seeing right now. Um, and you know, when it goes the other way, a lot of these things are are uh, are really exposed for what they are, which are sort of tenuous bus business models and capital structures that uh, should have been re-rated much lower, even at the time of issuance. So when the when the credit window is wide open, it's easy to borrow. You can borrow larger amounts than perhaps you should be able to that's right. for less deserving enterprises. And that's error that's right. on the part of the lender, maybe the borrower too. And then you get into an environment cyclically, eventually, maybe cyclically, or in your case, Jordan, maybe idiosyncratically, yep. where it turns out the amount you borrowed was more than you can support in tough times. That's right. That's really what, that's really what it's all about. That's right. And I think the, another facet of the, the cycle that we're in right now is the amount of duration that's been built into you know, the high yield debt, the leveraged loans that have been issued over the last four or five years, all as a function of the low interest rate environment that we've been in. Um, so we've talked about interest rates as a potential shock to the market. Um, if that does end up moving adversely, at least in the minds of the existing, you know, it could precipitate a very dramatic move downward. Sure. Uh, in the ex existing stock of debt. 
what are the special considerations uh, that influence the cycle, the credit cycle, in, in, in emerging markets? I think the first element is the level of country risk. So most EM investing is macro and top down, making very um, sort of, I think, long run projections about uh, secular growth, secular macroeconomic growth, which I think is, is almost a, a fool's game. And um, that element uh, seems, to, at least in EM, to send things into more of an extreme. As you mentioned earlier, in Mexico and Russia and elsewhere, we have seen projections of economic growth tied to commodity prices well out into the future. And this is the element that, that creates, for me, the biggest amount of risk. So w we want to take advantage of cycles. We believe there will be cycles. We don't know when. Right. That, this is really the, the fact of life that we accept, we live within, we fashion our behavior to meet. The market is not an accommodating machine, Peter Bernstein once told me. It will not give you high returns because you need them. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it will not give you a cycle because, because you have a lot of money. Julio, what's going to give the next opportunity and when? You know, there's already an opportunity in Brazil uh, because the economy still hasn't re recovered. They had a huge debt bubble, uh, a political crisis, and a devaluation unwound that bubble. And we're looking at some deals in the oil and gas space uh, and in the telecom space that I think will be interesting. Elsewhere in EM, uh, the party still rages. And the unexpected is always good for uh, opportunistic strategies in EM because the most important thing in EM is to have money when other people don't. And the willingness to spend it. Exactly. You know, I think I learned my first and probably my most important lesson about the things we've been discussing back in 1973-4 when somebody said to me, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to give you the three stages of a bull market. The first stage, only a few unusually perceptive people realize that there could be improvement. The second stage, everybody thinks, well, there actually is improvement going on. And the third stage, everybody and his brother says, things will get better forever. So about five, six years ago, we reached the conclusion that the psychological aspects of the market had already pretty much come back from the crisis. And we set up for ourselves a mantra, move forward but with caution. And uh, uh, what did that mean to you, uh, Bob? I think, you know, first and foremost, there is always a temptation. There's a siren song at every, you know, at the, at the latter stages of a bull cycle where other people are out there, you know, investing in certain, you know, instruments. And, and it, it looks like you should do the same, you know, again, if you tweak your underwriting, if you go off your mandate, if you go, if you become undisciplined, uh, generally speaking, you pay for it later. So I think when we say move forward but with caution, the important thing to notice is we're always a cautious firm. And when we say with caution, we mean with more caution than usual. And that's what I hear all of you are doing. Great. Well, listen, I, I, I appreciate the chance to talk about cycles. I'm fascinated by them. I know that you are. Importantly, I think Oak Tree's done a good job of managing through the cycles. Uh, nobody gets it perfect, uh, given the fact that we don't have foreknowledge. Uh, I once wrote a memo called, you can't predict, you can prepare. I like to think we've been doing that, and I thank you all for your efforts. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, appreciate it.